Hey there and welcome to Werribee Baptist Church today. We're a community based just outside of Melbourne, Australia and wherever you're at on your life journey, we hope you'll find WBC to be a place of acceptance, of love and of hope. A place to belong and to do life together. Now every week we have people attend online just like you are now. Maybe you're at home and watching the TV or maybe you're on your phone while on the go. If you're a regular online viewer, we would love to hear from you and be part of your faith journey. So, with a few minutes left before the service, why don't you quickly visit werribeebaptist.org.au slash online and introduce yourself and then we can connect with you in the coming days. Now, don't forget to follow and subscribe to us on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram and Spotify for new content every week and to help spread the word right now, why don't you give this video a thumbs up or a share into your feeds. Now, it is our hope that over the next hour, you'll feel welcomed, encouraged and challenged to become the person God knows you to be. So, for now, you can relax, say hi to others in the chat and get ready to see what God has to say to you today. Hello, my name is Amelia Lim. I've been attending WBC Church since I immigrated to Australia in November 2021 because I came to Australia because my husband passed away and both my adult children are here in Australia. When I first stepped foot into WBC, the first person to greet me was Sister Jo. She was very kind, she welcomed and accepted me. Thank you very much, Sister Jo. However, I still felt like an outsider, not knowing how I would fit in and have a sense of belonging in this church. Until I joined the life group a few months later, where Pastor Inoki invited me to the transition group meeting for newcomers. And that group helped me to meet up with new people. As a new arrival migrant, a person who has lost a loved one, and a newcomer to this church, it is at the life group that I started to have a sense of belonging. I have genuine and closer relationship with diverse people and I experience a growth in my spiritual life. My life group is also my family. I have grown in faith through our weekly studies. I've been encouraged to join ministries and I look forward to our weekly life group meetings. I would like to encourage anybody who is a new migrant, a newcomer to the church, anyone that is lonely and isolated to join a life group. It is a decision that you will not regret. It has changed my life and it can change yours too. Great to be with you today. Love what you do in our church as our Seeking Jesus Together Quiet Time Tool Editor. That's a big job. Thanks for doing that for us. Hey, but what is the Quiet Time Tool? Basically, it's a simple tool that we use day by day to not only help us dive deeper into God's Word, but also grow together as a spiritual community through what God's telling us. Diving deeper as a, as a community, and it, it's a simple tool, yeah? Mm. Super simple. Yep. So how, how does it work? So basically, whether you've got your, your booklet or your online using the app, 
Basically, you read a short passage of scripture in the morning, in the evening, whenever you choose to do it each day, and you take a look. You say, what's the, what's the writer saying? And then you ask yourself, how can I apply this to my life? So, hey, it's a great tool that you, you, you put together and you're helping us every month to design. Why should people do it? Why should we do it? We should be growing deeper in God's word. It's a great way to connect and build relationship, but also we're seeking Jesus together. Many of us are doing it. It's something to talk about, something to grow through. And basically, it's about growth. It's about growth, mm. right? So we're gonna to grow together. So if somebody wants to start doing this, how do they get access to this tool? Super easy. Um, every month, it's updated on the website where you can download it. It's updated on the app. And also you can find it at the info desk in the auditorium. Get onto it, start then, and let's seek Jesus together. Down the barrel. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sam. So my family and I, we didn't grow up Christian per se. Um, about as Christian as we got, as we would say, grace at the table. Um, it was, uh, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful, amen. Had no idea what that meant. Had no idea what the first bit meant, and we didn't know what amen meant, but I do remember um, as a kid uh, at, at night in New Zealand, uh, looking out my bedroom window, particularly at night, just looking up at the sky and, um, yeah, talking to Jesus, well, talking to God. There was that connection there, and I do remember that. It was about 2016, and uh, it was that period of, uh, another period of disillusionment with looking for new jobs, because that job sucked, and then try a new job, and then that one sucked. Um, looking for a structure or a meaning and a purpose. Uh, so there were a few things that were tried, you know, disciplines and try this technique. And uh, there was one person that kept reoccurring as, as maybe try this as a, as a lesson. And it was Jesus. And at that point, it was more of an academic thing for me to go, well, all right, what was, what was Jesus saying then? You know, there's a lesson with, with some of the things that he did. So it was 2020, uh, lockdowns, it was all kicking off. Um, I decided just to um, do my own actual reading of the Bible. So I downloaded a two year Bible reading plan. And at that particular point on this plan, it uh, started me on reading the book of Numbers. Terrifying, um, not a great place to start. So I dropped that, dropped the plan and started reading from the New Testament. So I started with Matthew and got to Sermon on the Mount. And that's when it started to build a relationship that um, Jesus wasn't just a historical figure to me anymore, but what he was saying was actually talking to me. Like me, not just here, but me as a, as a person. So I'm really grateful for that because I know what it was like without, and now with, it, there is more meaning, uh, certainly more purpose, and there is a direction, even though I, I don't fully understand where it's going, um, but I know I'm on a path of some sort, and I'm trusting that God's got me.
We're about to head inside and hear from some people who call WBC home. We're going to hear why they're here, what brought them here, what makes WBC tick. Let's go. Hello, how are you? I would love to know how long have you been attending here at WBC? Over 10 years. What do you love about the WBC community? Lots, lots of warm and friendly and caring people. 43 years. Amazing. Now, if you can pinpoint one thing, what do you love about WBC? Well, the fellowship and all the people here. I love the fact that we can worship Jesus together. Hello. How long have you been here at WBC? Yeah, tough, tough crowd. Uh, my name is Gopal and I'm being for the last one year. For one year? Yeah. And tell me what, what brought you here, what do you love about it, what's kept you here? We started knowing about this church through friends who, came, who comes here. And from there, yeah, we love the fellowship here and we started continuing. I've been attending since April last year and I'm loving every step that I'm taking so far. How long have you been attending WBC? Oh, maybe three weeks. Oh, and what is what would you say is the standout? What, what do you love about it? The education. It's, I've learned so much in three weeks compared to, gosh, for a long time. Seeing that, okay, I get to hear from God today. Yeah, we have to go to God's presence and hear the God's word. It's really powerful here that I can see the presence of God here. He know. And me <laughs> what, what keeps you coming back week after week? Worship. That my kids go to a kids church that they love going to. What do you love about it? It's just a, an amazing church family and they've been with us through our, our tough times and we just, we love it. Hey there and welcome to Werribee Baptist Church today. We're a community based just outside of Melbourne, Australia and wherever you're at on your life journey, we hope you'll find WBC to be a place of acceptance, of love and of hope. A place to belong and to do life together. Now every week we have people attend online just like you are now. Maybe you're at home and watching the TV or maybe you're on your phone while on the go. If you're a regular online viewer, we would love to hear from you and be part of your faith journey. So why don't you quickly visit werribeebaptist.org.au slash online and introduce yourself and then we can connect with you in the coming days. Now don't forget to follow and subscribe to us on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram and Spotify for new content every week and to help spread the word right now, why don't you give this video a thumbs up or a share into your feeds. Now it is our hope that over the next hour you'll feel welcomed, encouraged and challenged to become the person God knows you to be. So. For now, you can relax, say hi to others in the chat, and get ready to see what God has to say to you today. and there's room in the middle could you squeeze in a little bit because we're going to have plenty of people still coming in and we want to make room for them so everyone can enjoy the service today it's good friday it's a time of reflection a time to consider what jesus did for us and it's a time to celebrate that as well we're going to do a few things today we're going to sing some songs we're going to see some video we're going to participate in communion and if you're online with us if you're joining us online i would encourage you to go ahead and get your elements and prepare for that grab something to drink and something to to eat for that and then we are going to hear a challenge from the scriptures to help us center our focus on jesus and what he did today a little bit of housekeeping if you're a parent and you have a child that ends up needing a nappy change or they're just getting too squirmy or they need a feed or whatever we have a parenting room right back there in the corner you'll still be able to see the service hear what's going on we also have in the 
building next door. We have overflow set up for those that uh, are coming in still once this room's full. And if you have some rambunctious children, that might be a great place for you. There's also a gated area out in the foyer for kids. There's kids' packs back there. So if you need some help with any of that, there's also toilets down the hallway over here. If you need help with anything, you see the people in the blue vest and people walking around with lanyards and name tags. They will be happy to help you, to guide you, and to make your day uh, a little more uh, enjoyable. So thanks for joining us today. Now turn your eyes to the screen. The Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering. Jesus, the prophet, the teacher, the savior, the king is condemned to die. To carry the instrument that would cause his own death through the streets and the alleys and dust of Jerusalem, he picks up the cross and falls to the ground. Simon will carry this cross now. Jesus will fall again, Mary will weep again, people will jeer again, and he will stand again only to fall again, only to stumble, and then he will come to the place where his final breath will escape. There, stripped naked in torturous pain, Golgotha, that hill, will be witness to say, truly he was the most righteous of men. Read the sign, read it well. He was king, death is felled. The sun would go out and then up from the ground, hear the shout of the dead that were raised and the sound of the tearing of curtains, the temple returning to open the holy of holies and learning that this way of sorrows, injustice and horrors was destined for one who would travel it for us. And now in our stumbling, our weakness and humbling, we look to the teacher, the savior, the healer. We look to Jesus, the servant, the king. In his great compassion, he covers our sin, now embraced in mercy and blood-bought forgiveness. This way, this incomparable display of the greatest of loves caught history off guard. And heaven's reward is to call you, is to call you, is to call you, friend.
give God praise this morning. Can we lift up the name of Jesus in this place? Oh Lord, we just thank you this morning as your people, as your church, we remember. Lord, we reflect on the price you paid for us. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquity because of your suffering. This morning we have peace with God. And so Lord, this morning you invite us that if we are weary and if we are heavy laden, that we should come to the foot of the cross and, and you'll give us rest, God. And so I pray for everybody here this morning, God, that might carry a burden. I pray for every doubt, every fear, God, every worry, every angst, Lord. This morning we come to the foot of the cross and we just say, we lay it down before you. And we ask God that you give everybody rest, Lord. I thank you that it is your brokenness that brings us wholeness. It is your suffering that brings us healing. Father, we pray in particular this morning, God, as we stand together as your people, we pray, God, for the city. Lord, we pray for the peace and the prosperity of this city in the name of Jesus, God. We pray for every leader. God, whether that be in government, whether that be, God, in our community, in business, in education, Father, we pray, God, that you bless our leaders in Jesus' name, God. And we pray, God, for those in authority this morning, God, as they strategize, God, as they think about laws and policies, about the future, about the peace and prosperity of our city, I pray, Lord, that you would lead them in Jesus' name, that you would guide every decision in the name of Jesus. Father, we stand this morning humbled just for the unity amongst our churches in Wyndham, Lord. We thank you for that. And so our prayer this morning is, God, that, that, with that, that the unity will continue, Father, just to grow in Jesus' name like you prayed, Lord, that make us one as you and the Father are one. Because by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So God, we pray, make us one. Make us a shining light in this city in Jesus' name. A light that pierces the darkness, God. In Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Come on, saints. Let's continue to worship.
work is finished and hell still knows that the grave is still empty the stone is still wrong and you're still day coming together like this to worship our Lord on Good Friday so so good why don't you give somebody a high five right next to you right now hey so good fantastic fantastic oh you may take your seats well we're going to come to that time now where we give in fact you know Christianity is giving all the time isn't it because he has given everything for us and so we give all back to him as well. I, it's exciting. But anyway, let me, let me first talk a little bit about why we're going to be giving in this service today, what the purpose of that is. You see, God has been doing something amazing in the churches of Wyndham. God has been doing amazing things in this whole area. And it is through you. It is through your passion, through your belief, through your, your love for God. And so today we're going to take up an offering. And this is what we're taking up the offering for. Who knows? I mean, some of you were here at, at the Christmas events where there was over 5,000 people that came out for carols. How many of you were part of that group? Give us a wave, hey? I tell you, what an amazing thing. Over 5,000 people that came out for that particular event. Well, what we're going to be doing in this offering, we're taking up an offering to give towards the next carols by candlelight as well. Because who knows, this, this, the church of Jesus Christ in this city needs to be able to proclaim, whether it's Easter, whether it's Christmas, that we know that God is real. And that God is moving, amen? But we need your help as well. You know, we need your help to be able to give into this as well. There's a, there's a number of different ways that you can give. You'll see those up on the screen behind me here. And so I want to encourage you in these different ways that you can do this. 
But we're going to pray. We're going to just Lord, ask God's blessing upon this time. We're going to ask God's blessing, particularly when it comes to this next event. Now, you might think like Christmas. Didn't we just have Christmas? Well, it comes around pretty quick, doesn't it? So it's going to come along very quick this year as well. So for this year, for the end of this year, at Carols by Candlelight, we would ask you, please get behind this and give. Now, you've got the QR codes on the seats there as well. There's a few different ways you can give. And, and also there will be the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the online giving. Uh, you can see how to give to that as well. Uh, just many different ways to do it. So we're going we're gonna to send it around, you know, an opportunity for you to be able to give here today. Uh, but, or, or not send around, I should say, but to give you an opportunity in these number of different ways that you can do it. But we are giving to something that's going to make a difference. We are giving to something which is going to actually open up the eyes and wake up this city. Amen? So come on, let's, let's just pray right now. And then I'm going to ask us if we can give and we're going to continue to worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for this amazing thing that you're doing, Lord, in this city, Lord. Lord God, the way that you're using your people, you're using the church. And as, and, and as we just sit here today and we see churches represented right around this area, I pray, Lord God, that you would bless everyone that gives, Lord. And particularly, Lord, as we give into the future and we give, Lord God, into what you are doing, Lord, in this city, particularly when it comes to Christmas this year. And so we thank you, God, for the opportunity to do that. By faith, Lord, we step out. By faith, we give. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. What can wash away my sin? the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fountain, no, nothing but the blood. What a beautiful old hymn. We're going to have a little audience participation today. So I've got, if you were given a communion cup when you walked through the doors this morning, I'd ask you to open that now, both layers, because it makes quite the commotion when we do it in the middle of things. As you let the words of that old hymn wash over you, you know, I think of communion as a time that becomes so familiar to us. God has made us in such a wonderful way to have muscle memory. So often we can go through the motions of things without ever engaging our heart or our mind. And I don't want that to be true for us today. Because there becomes a complacency with the familiar. And Good Friday gives us a chance as Christians to focus on the centrality of the cross for our faith. Isn't that a beautiful truth that they just sang for us? So I want us to consider the significance of our celebration today as we prepare our hearts for this time of communion together as a community of faith from churches across Wyndham and online wherever you may be joining us as we join around the Lord's table to celebrate on this Good Friday. The book of Matthew sets the stage for us and, and I want us to really feel the, the weight of what was going on. So I'm going to... Um, come to a few places in this, and I need you to help me with that. So I'll say something when I say the people or the crowd said, and I'll tell you what they said, and I want you all to lift up your voices so you can just feel what it was like to be a part of that crowd on the day of Christ's crucifixion. So will you do that with me? You can help me with that, yes? After the arrest and mock trial of Jesus, Pilate addressed the crowd that had gathered. He asked them, whom do you want me to release? For you, Barabbas, who was a thief and a robber, or Jesus, who is called Christ. We read that the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas because they wanted to destroy Jesus. They had been envious, and Pilate knew that. They were envious of his growing influence. So knowing that, Pilate asked the crowd again, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Can you raise your voices and say, Barabbas? Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. It's hard to say, isn't it? And they said, and he said, Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Pilate took water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. 
see to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be upon us and on our children. His blood be upon us and our children. You know, we're no different than that crowd. We know a little more than they did at the day. But the profoundness of their statement blew blew me away when I read it earlier this week. His blood be on us and our children. His blood would be upon them for generations to come. An atonement making right for all generations, including us right here in this room. We have the benefit of seeing how it all fits together, for we can read in the book of Hebrews, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood under the old covenant, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus became the perfect sacrifice on the cross as an offering for all. Paul, writing to the Philippian church, said this, he explained it this way, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself, obedient to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him, the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. John, writing in 1 John, said, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We celebrate this time of communion, this Good Friday remembering Christ's sacrifice for us, for you, for me. We see how that went down in the book of Corinthians. The account of Jesus sharing a last supper with his disciples before Good Friday. And Paul writes it this way, For I, Paul, pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we take the body of Christ together? You know, the symbolism that's in the bread is also in the cup. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let us share the communion and the cup that was, represents Jesus' blood. Paul goes on to write, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Will you pray with me just a prayer of thanksgiving for all Christ has done for us on this Good Friday? Heavenly Father, we lift our voices up to you, our hearts, our minds, being remindful that we, just like that crowd, would have yelled crucify. Father, for crucifixion is exactly what you had ordained before the beginning of time, to redeem a people for yourself, a people for your name. Father, we thank you at this time for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, your perfect sacrifice for us, for he did what we could not do ourselves. We ask you to humble us, to humbly come to Christ as our Savior. Father, that we don't think that we can do it ourselves, but that we rely on your Holy Spirit to lift us up out of our pits of despond, and we just pray that you would Let your spirit run through this community, through this community of faith. And Father, we just pray that your name would be high and lifted up, that you might receive all the glory deserved that you deserve. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but 
Well, good morning. Yeah, hey, that's a good response. I love that. <laughs> My name's Chris. I'm the uh, lead pastor at Wyndham City Church. And today, I really just want to unpack briefly one of the, I think, most amazing things that, that has been achieved on Good Friday that sometimes we, we can forget or maybe we're not familiar with it at times to forget to re- reflect over. But it in particular, if we reflect upon it, I believe it has the capacity to help us through any season or any circumstance in our life. And what I'm talking about, right, is this little thing called position. Do you know that position is a powerful thing? There is a position that Jesus Christ accomplished for people on that original Good Friday. You see, position, like I said, it's so powerful. I mean, you just think about it in your own life, right? Who wants to be in a bad position? You don't need to raise your hands if that's you, right? Okay, but position, we're always subconsciously or consciously going after a better position in our life, right? If you just think about it when you go to the supermarket, you've done the groceries, right? And then, then am I only, the only one that does this? But when we get close to the register, we are looking for what is the shortest line so we can get on out of that, that grocery store. You know what I'm talking about, right? We position ourselves in work, in a, in a place to get a raise, or we're looking for a position that can get us to a higher position in life. This one, this one really frustrates me. I don't know if it frustrates you, but who likes to be positioned behind a slow vehicle? <laughs> Come on. You know, like Wyndham area is like the, grow, like the largest growing capacity area in, in Australia at the moment, but we seem to have a lot of single lane roads here. Is I'm, am I the only one who's noticed this? And so for me, I really dislike being stuck behind a, a vehicle, and I'll let me preface this, going slower than the speed limit. All right, I am not saying I speed here, okay. But, but there is something that's really frustrating. So how I, how I handle this moment is what I start to do is I start to calculate in my mind all the double lane intersections that I know are ahead of me on that road so that I can give myself some form of hope knowing that I can get past and out of this position and zoom around in front of the slow-moving vehicle. But, but what happens sometimes, is because we know the roads around our house, right, is when you start to calculate the road ahead, sometimes you can have this moment when you realize that there are no more double intersection lanes left. <laughs> and you just feel the, the void inside. You feel hope just disintegrating in your life because you realize in that moment you are going to have to deal with being stuck in this position for, for miles, right? No one likes, the reason we disintegrate when we think of these things is because no one likes to be stuck in a bad position. And I actually think that this is one of the main reasons why, it's, uh, uh, why some people find it hard to come back into church. I think that sometimes we can, we, we, can, we can look at the positions and the conditions in our life and we can start to think that we're not deserving of God's presence or God's, you know, his blessings or anything like this. That we can get stuck in a place sometimes where we feel like we don't have the right to come back to God or maybe to come to God for the first time. And it's for this particular reason why a person needs to understand and know the truth about the position that Jesus Christ puts our person in when they come to him. Now, I shared this particular scripture with my congregation about a year back. And, uh, and I shared, so we're going to have that up on the screen in a second. And I shared with my congreg- the congregation that, that if you were to read this scripture on its own, right, it can actually appear quite deflating. So let's read it, because that'll be a good thing to do, right? Here we go. All right, so Paul says this in Romans 3, 10 to 12. He says, as it is written, he's speaking from the Old Testament, none is righteous, no, not one. Can you feel your self-confidence coming on, (laughs) right? No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Wow, he just goes for it. No one does good, not even one. You can see how this scripture, if you just look at it by itself, it appears rather deflating. But when you begin to understand the context in which Paul is writing here, 
you realize it's not meant to deflate, it's actually meant to liberate. Because that's what God does with his word. You see, the context here is you've got to remember when Paul's writing this, right? He's writing this when Christianity is birthing. You have got this era in time when you've got Jewish people and Gentile people, Gentile being anyone who's not a Jewish person, right? They are coming together under one umbrella for the first time. There, there is this clashing of cultures and positions. Could you imagine some of the struggles that people would have been going through in this particular time. You've got those that have been doing for their entire life everything they can to best outwork the law. Could you imagine what they might have been struggling with when all of a sudden they have to accept a Gentile who was sinning all the way and eating bacon all the way up until yesterday? And then, and then the word is saying, this revelation about Jesus Christ is saying that they are now also welcomed into your family. This would be a hard thing for some of the Jewish people back then to, to grab a hold of. Their position was being threatened. Then you flip it on the other side and you've got the Gentiles and they're in this position where they come into the church and they're finding out, wow, the God of Israel was actually the real God. And then they're looking at Susie and John who've been doing the law their whole life and they're like, I can't. How could I ever be as holy as Susie? You know, there's this struggle. See, what was happening at the time is people were having a, a hard time dealing with the positions they had with each other and also in front of God. And so what Paul does is he comes along and he just clears everything up. He, he says, guess what? Everyone's in the same box. Come on. Okay, I will admit though, granted, it's not particularly the best box to be in. All right, that part in particular is deflating. But however, when you realize what he goes on to say is when you realize it's not a negative, it's a positive. He goes on to share, here we go. He goes on to share what Jesus accomplished on that original Good Friday. He says this in Romans 3, 21. This is exciting. He says this, but now, apart from the law, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. One translation says manifest. So effectively, he's saying that, but now it has become into existence. Another way, he's saying here, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. He's saying that the law and the prophets were always speaking of a day that God was going to make another way. What, what I'm telling you today, church, is that this is exciting. It's because what Paul's saying back then is it has finally happened. Amen. There is now another way that has been made possible. Let, let me explain explain to you or demonstrate to you the liberation that comes with this right. You see, there's this road in Western Victoria that links Apollo Bay and Colac. And my wife's from Colac, and so we go there every single year. And we often do the trip between Colac and Apollo Bay because her parents, what they do is they vacay in Apollo Bay. So I'm often going between the two. Now, there is this road in the middle of this road that turns off from Apollo Bay, and it goes somewhere. I don't know where, right? Every year, we drive down to Apollo Bay, and it always happens to be at the end of our holiday, right? And, and I drive past this road, and I see it. And why it grabs my attention is because I like caves. I love tunnels. I don't have time to go into it. It's a thing. And the, the, the trees have got, like, they've, gone over, they've grown over, and they've made a canopy over the road, right? And so I drive past this road every year, and I see this natural cave-like road, and then the... Uh, cave over the road, and the road turns off into the unknown. And so I just want to see what's at the end. It's like an itch inside me. I want to know what's at the end of that road. But every year, for like seven or eight years, now I'm coming up to 10 years married. That's a lot of years, church, to look at this road. And I'm like, I've never got to the end of this road. So at the beginning of last year, my wife, she arranges it with her parents while they're at Apollo Bay. We're going to use their house as a base camp. You know what I'm talking about? Free rent. Come on, we know it. 
And so we use this as a base camp. My wife, she organizes all these day trips for our family to go off and see all these family adventures. We go to a lake one day, do bird watching. The next day, we go to this place called Beach Forest. We pick blueberries there. You can pick blueberries yourself. It's a thing. And then we went to the Californian Redwoods. It was great. Anyway, we come to the final day of our free vacation at our parents, at Eve's parents' place. And she goes, Chris, we've got to see our parents all right, cool, we we pack the kids up into the car in their suitcases and we put them in there and we head on down to to Apollo Bay. On the way back, church, I see it. It's dusk, the kids are sleeping. You don't wanna add any more seconds to your necessary journey. When your kids are sleeping, you know what I'm talking about, parents? You don't wanna wake those gremlins, you know. And And so I'm like, I see the road and I just watch it go past me again. And I say to Eve, Eve, it happened again. And she's like, what? She goes, that road, I still haven't got to the end of that road. And she says to me, she goes, Chris, what are you talking about? That road leads to Beach Forest. We went there the other day. (laughs) We ate blueberries. And I start saying to her, you're telling me that I've already got to the end of the road? She's like, yes, Chris, we just went in another way. In this moment, yeah, Justin, you get it? In this moment, the Liberation Church, I'm like, I'm like 10 tons lighter. I'm like, I've already achieved what I thought I could just never seem to achieve. And this is what Paul is saying here. He goes on to say in Romans 3.22, the righteousness is given. It's given, you've got it another way. It's given through faith. If you've got faith in Jesus Christ, you have got righteousness already. This is so good. I love it. He goes on to say that if you've just believed, there is now no difference between Jew and Gentile. We're all in the same box, but it's a really good thing. The problem with the boxes of the law, the law's kind of like this. You see, the the law's like me trying to grow a beard. Like I've been trying to do it for years and years and years and just trying to get it real lush, but it's like patchy everywhere, right? And finally, at, at some, some mature stage of my life, I'm not telling you how old I am, right? But it starts to become lush, but then I realize it's also getting gray so you can't see. <laughs> the law is like a never forever. My beard's like a never forever. You know, you can't, it's like a dead end road, so God had to make another way. And he says this in Romans 2, 23 to 24, he says, For all have sinned, everyone's in that basket, and fallen short of the glory of God. But then he says, And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption. Through the redemption. This is what Jesus did for us on Good Friday. That came by Christ Jesus. What he's saying here is we, today, ladies and gentlemen, If you believe in Jesus Christ, get this, we are justified freely by his grace. Grace is on all of you. Grace, it's not by our works. Often we can let these thoughts come in and deceive our mind that we're not deserving to come back into his presence or we've been away for a long time and we're fearing coming back in and what people might think and all that jazz. But it's not to do with any of the things that we work for. It's to do with faith. It's not our behavior, it's our faith. That's what makes a person righteous. This is epic. All right, but the problem, let me me, me wrap up here. But the problem with this amazing revelation is sometimes it just seems too good to be true. So we feel like there's this danger in accepting this, right? But the reason why we go to that place is because everyone still has feelings and we can often feel condemnation. You see, truth is, And condemnation can be two different things. It's kind of like this. Let me put it into perspective for you. I'm going to share you the scripture real quick because Paul makes sure that he puts in a scripture, which is really God putting it in there, right? To make sure that none of us fall into the trick of this particular trick so that we never stop coming back to him, even if we sinned yesterday or we think our sin is too big. He says this in Romans 8, 